Okay, so this is going on page 84. And we're moving to circles. We're going to come back to polygons after we learn some things. Um, but there's lots of vocabulary today. So we're going to start with the interior of a circle and the exterior of a circle. Right? Interior and exterior is just what it sounds like. The interior of a circle is the set of all points inside the circle. And the exterior of a circle is a set of all points outside the circle. The circle is just the ring that you see it that is the circle. A circle is not solid. Okay, it's it's empty inside and the like the black circle that you see here, there is no thickness, just like there is no thickness with a line. Okay. So you have point you can have points inside the circle, outside the circle, or on the circle. And then we have different parts or different lines in line segments that intersect the circle. So blank is a segment whose endpoints lie on the circle. So if you look over here, line segment AB, that is a line segment. The endpoints lie on the circle. This is called a chord, which is something I feel like you should know, but nobody ever really seems to know. So um, I don't know. This is a chord. Right. And then we have this line. A blank is a line that intersects a circle at two points. So this blue line here intersects my circle at two distinct points. Right. So it is a line that intersects a circle at two points. This is called, I know this is a new word for you, it's a secant, S-E-C-A-N-T, secant, okay? It's a secant line. Now, I want you to look at the secant line in the chord. The two points that, these two points here where the line intersects the circle, the line segment in between that, that's a chord as well, right? So a chord is always part of a secant line, because if I continue the line that this chord is made, uh, that this chord lives in, that line would be a secant line. Does that make sense to you? Line segment AB is a chord. Line AB would be a secant. Okay. Does that make sense? So this here, this is a secant line. All right, so then we have a blank is a line in the same plane. So there'll be a lot of things we talk about today where it'll say same plane or coplanar. That's really just saying we're still working in two dimensions, that it's not three dimensions, nothing's three dimensional yet. So we're still just in two dimensions. So a blank is a line in the same plane as a circle that intersects at exactly one point. So this green line down here, line M, it intersects this circle right here. Remember, an intersection is what they have in common or what they share. It doesn't have anything to do with, like, passing through something. So that line does not pass through the circle, but it does intersect the circle. It just touches it at that one point right there. That line is called a tangent. And where have you heard, where have you heard that word before? Sine, cosine, tangent with the trig, right? Um, so there is a reason. Yes, sir. Couldn't what be a segment? Yes, yes, we'll get there in just a second. But a tangent is, um, a tangent line is called tangent for a reason that totally does relate to trig. You will not see that relationship right now. We have to go and talk about circles, talk about what this line is called and, and how it works with our circle. Then we got to go talk about some other things. Then we'll make that connection. So there is a reason it's called tangent. Secant is actually a trig function as well. That's just not one that we have talked about yet. And there is a reason that these pieces are called what they are called, but you won't see that right now. So as far as you're concerned with what we're doing, this really doesn't relate to trig. Um, I mean, like I said, it does. It's just not in the, in the sense of what we're doing right now. So this line right here is called a tangent line. Well, thank you. <laughs> then... That point C there, the point where the tangent and the circle intersect is called the point of tangency. You know, it sounds all fancy, doesn't it? Oops, misspelled. Tangency. 
So tangency is just a different form of the word tangent. But this point right here is the point of tangency. Now, just like Braden was saying, that that's a tangent, this is the definition of a tangent line. You can have tangent segments, you can have tangent rays, but they would all have to be part of a tangent line. Like I can't have a ray that would start here and just come out off the circle and then me say that it's tangent because it only intersects at one point because that would actually be part of a secant line, okay? So a tangent ray and a tangent segment are just part of a tangent line. You can have secant segments and secant rays as well. Now a chord is not a secant segment um, because it's a chord, but um, if, like if I had another, another point out here and it was C and I connected it, then line segment CB would be a secant segment, okay? But there will have to be parts of those other things. Yes, sir? You mean like if it started here and went this way? No, because that would be like, that would be a ray. It, well, if it's a line and there's an arrow, that means it's going to keep going. But if it's like a ray or a segment, that would actually be part of a secant line. So it's like, what is it? If you're, it's not truly a line that's going to continue if it's a segment or a ray, it would have to be part of one of those to be a segment of it. Does that make sense to you? That's a good question. Because that, that is where people get confused sometimes. So they think, oh, it only intersects at one point, so it must be tangent. No, it would have to actually have been a part of a tangent line. We good? Those are good questions. Anything else? All right. So then let's look at this picture here, and we're going to identify these. So we're going to identify each line or segment that intersects circle A. So you name circles by their center points. So that tells me here that I know that A is the center. Not because it's red, because yours obviously isn't red, because yours isn't printed in color. Um, but when you call it circle A, you're naming it by the center. One of the things that you're allowed to assume, which is not really assuming that, even if it didn't say circle A, if it looks like the intention is for A to be the center, A is the center. You're not guessing, nobody's trying to trick you by it being off just a little bit or anything like that. Okay. All right, so a chord. What is one chord we could name here? BC. Those are just letters. So. Line segment BC. Okay, good. So line segment BC is one chord. What's another one? Line segment EF. Now, those are the two that we can see on the picture. Are there other ones that exist? Yes, like line segment BE, line segment EC, like there's a bunch we can name. Those are just the ones that we see. And then there's an infinite amount more that we can't even name because we don't have letters. But All right, so then what about tangents that we can see? Line L. Like I can't li call it line C, but it is line L. Good. And then radii, radii, which is plural for radius, because we don't say radiuses. So, name a radius here. Line segment, okay, BA and AC. So the definition of a radius, which I didn't define up here because you should know what a radius is, it's um, a segment that goes from the center to any point on the circle. And so, again, there's an infinite amount of places we could draw it. B, um, A, F, A, E, those would be a radius also, but we'll just name the ones we can see. All right, what about a secant? Line E, F, okay? Line E, F. And then I want you to see that these two are both named E, F, but one of them is a line and one of them is a segment. Therefore, one of them is a secant and one of them is a chord. Okay, and a chord is always part of a secant line, which means I know without even looking at the picture that line BC has to be a secant line. Does that make sense to you? Now, just because you have two letters that are naming a secant doesn't mean that the segment made up of those letters has to be a chord. Because I could use some other points that are out here and use the two, or you know, even two points over here to name that line. Okay, but if it's a chord, it has to be part of a secant. All right, and then what's the diameter on this? Line segment BC. Do we all agree with that? I, have, I mean, I'm pretty confident y'all know what a diameter is. You can lay, you can see it, you can identify it, but I'm not so sure that you can actually define it correctly for me. So who wants to try? You know, tell me what you're thinking. Okay, so a a, the distance from one side of the circle to the other. So isn't this the distance from one side of the circle to the other? 
has to go through the, the center, okay? But, um, so that's talking about distance. So let's not talk about the, the length of it, just as, the, as a figure itself, just like we did up here. I mean, I know it's line segment BC, but I don't want to talk about length or distance or anything, even though that's, that's right. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But, so it has to go through the center, but what is it? It's a line segment. What is it related to a circle? What is it with this, with this vocabulary? What is it? Where else is it in your list? It's a chord. Okay, so a diameter is a chord. But to distinguish it between EF, I have to say it is a chord that what? Passes through the center of the circle. So what a diameter is as a figure itself, it is a chord that passes through the center of the circle. Does that make sense to you? And it is the longest cord that's on the circle. It is the greatest distance across the circle. But it's basically the length of the segment that is the cord that passes through the center of the circle. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Right, good. And again, I know you know what it is and all that kind of stuff. And you've probably never really been, the real definition has probably never even been talked to you um, about it, talked with you about it before. Um, but, you know, we talk about figures and we talk about numbers and how they have to be kept separate. And we have equality and we have congruence. And I can say, you know, the, um, a line segment is this, but the length of the line segment is this. Well, with a radius and a diameter, those are two things where you could, I could talk about either thing. I can say that the radius is line segment AC, but I could also say the radius is five inches. Okay, so whether you can call it the radius, whether you're talking about the figure or the length of it itself, either way, okay? So that's what this remember part here says. This says, remember that the terms radius and diameter may refer to segments or to the length of segments. We can talk about the radius as a as a picture, as a figure, or as a number. Okay. We're all okay with that? All right, so then we're going to look at pairs of circles. How many things are in a pair? Two. Good job. All right, so pairs of circles. And so we have three sets of things we're going to look at here. Starting with these two. It says two circles are blank. Circles if and only if. So there's that biconditional there. They have congruent radii. So these two... This radius is congruent to this radius. So what do you think is true about those circles? They're congruent. If the radius is congruent, the circles have to be congruent. Okay? And the diameter is congruent. And, um, but like in a triangle, if I said that the height of this triangle is congruent to the height of this triangle, that doesn't necessarily mean the triangles are congruent, right? Because other things can be different. But really, the radius drives everything here. So that means you got congruent circles. All right, so... Do you think you can have two circles that are not congruent? Absolutely. Can you have two circles that are not similar? The similar, they have the same what? Shape, but a different size, right? So aren't all circles circular? Yes. I mean, so if you have a circle and it's not circular, then it's no longer a circle, right? So it, they're all similar to each other. All circles have the same shape. So all circles are similar. So we don't even talk about similar circles because it's irrelevant. They don't even exist. Okay, so then this next set here, these circles are, again, coplanar because we're all in two dimensions here. And they have the same center. So this is like if I was to drop a pebble in the water and those circles ripple out like this, right? They have the same center. These are called concentric. Concentric. So the prefix con, what do you think that means? So what does conqueso mean? You don't speak Spanish. You ever been to a Mexican restaurant? With. With cheese. Conqueso. Let's see. It's okay. That's like, that's the extent of my Spanish. I mean, come on. So with. Con means with. Right? So with centers, right? With centers. So with the same center, that's what it means. Okay? Does that make sense to you? So these are congruent circles. I don't speak Spanish. You eat queso wine, I know it. Circles <laughs> and concentric. All right. And then we have two co again coplanar circles that intersect at exactly one point. 
So it could intersect like this or like this, just at one point though. So basically I can take this circle and like flip it in and then it would look like that one. Um, what do we call a line that intersects a circle at one point? A tangent line. So these two circles are tangent to each other. So we have tangent circles. Okay. Tangent circles. Um, so it's not just lines that can be tangent. Circles can be tangent. Lines can be tangent to other curves and other shapes. And so these are tangent circles. Right now we're really just concerned with lines and circles together. Okay. Any questions at this point? Good. Okay. All right. So then we have it says find the length of each radius, identify the point of tangency, and write the equation of the tangent line at this point. So we have two circles there. Remember, we name our circles by their center points. So we have circle A and circle B. And when you name them, you don't have to write out the word. You can use a symbol like we do for a triangle. But if I just did this. It could look like an O or a zero, and we could confuse ourselves later on down the line. So to do a circle, it's like a circle with a dot in it. So that's circle A and circle B. And we're going to find the length of the radius of each one. So what's the radius of circle A? From the center to any point on the circle. So from the center, one, two, three, four. Right? Or one, two, three, four. You can count vertically and horizontally, you just can't count diagonally. So even this length I know is four. Not that I get to count diagonally, but it has to be the same. So this radius is four. What's the radius of circle B? Two. So then I also need the point of tangency. What's the point of tangency? The point of tangency is where the tangent line intersects the circle, or where the circles intersect each other. Where does everything intersect? Oh, goodness gracious. I know, it was a really hard question, but it is three zero, it is not zero three, okay? Three zero. All right, and then I need the equation of the tangent line. So is that gonna be an easy or difficult equation to write? Really easy. It's the equation of that line. Yeah. The this is the tangent line, so I want the equation of this line. This is a vertical line. The line is undefined? I don't think so, because I'm pretty sure I see it. What's undefined about it? The slope. The slope is undefined. But that doesn't give me the equation. So if it's a vertical line, it's either an, it's either an x equals or a y equals line, right? And vertical is which one? X equals vertical is x equals. We cannot miss this anymore, okay? Okay, so x equals what? Three. That is the equation of my line. Yes, x has v's in it for vertical. Exactly. Okay, we all good? All right. So then we have this situation here where we have tangent lines, and these are called a common tangent. Okay, so a common tangent is a line that is tangent to two circles. So this is two lines that are tangent to each circle in each case, but that's because other things happen here. So these two tangent lines do not intersect in between the circles. These two tangent lines do. So this right here is called externally tangent. And these two are internally tangent. Yeah. 
Yes, they will intersect. They just don't intersect in between the circles. Yes. And if the circles were congruent, it's possible that they would never, and they could be parallel. But yeah, the, yes, you're right. Those lines will eventually intersect. Now, this vocabulary with what a tangent line is and all this kind of stuff, um, these are important things that are going to come back to you. Uh, I, I know I've said this before, but when you're in Algebra 2, you're really not going to talk about anything we talk about this year, like almost none of it. And um, so that you're, you're going to be thinking, well, she was totally lying. She said all this stuff was important, and we hadn't talked about it at all. But then in pre-cal, it's coming back. And I find myself a lot saying, remember when we talked about this in geometry? Remember when we talked about this in geometry? So tangent lines, secant lines, these theorems here, things that are coming back, and you have to remember them and be able to apply them. Okay? You can keep it. Mm -hmm. I highly suggest you keep your eyes in. All right, so this theorem here says, it says a line is tangent to a circle. All right, so if a line is tangent to a circle, then it is blank to the radius, the radius drawn to the point of tangency. So let's talk about that terminology first. So we have this line that is tangent. I know it's tangent because it says it is. And again, th these are not going to be drawn where there's like almost a little off, so it's kind of to confuse you. There are quite a few times, this included, where it is tangent, but it almost looks like it, like it intersects at more than one point because it kind of looks squished on there. It may flat out tell you something is tangent, or it may say something like it does right here where it says, assume that the segments that appear to be tangent are tangent. So basically they're telling you, you're not assuming anything, that's fine, we're not going to go in there and name them all, that it's all good to think that. Okay, but this is a tangent line. This, so this point right here is the point of tangency. And so this is the radius drawn to the point of tangency, because I can draw the radius anywhere around the circle, right? But if the radius intersects right there, then it is perpendicular to the tangent line. So that is an important relationship there. So that gives you a right angle, which can help you with some things. So line L is perpendicular to line segment AB. Then, this is kind of the converse, but not exactly. If a line is perpendicular to a radius of a circle at a point on the circle, okay, so it can't be a point inside the circle, outside the circle, but the radius and the, this line are perpendicular and they intersect right there on the circle, then the line is tangent to the circle. It has to be. So then here I've got that line... L is tangent to circle C. Oh, line M, thank you, dang it. It's not line L because that's in the other picture. I have the wrong one. So line M, I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Good job. Line M is tangent to circle C. We good? Questions? Okay. All right, so then again, this says assume that the segments that appear to be tangent are tangent. So it's not really an assumption that you are making. And we are looking for the length of RT. Okay? So in order for me to find the length of RT, I need I need the value of X. Right? Is there anything on this triangle that I could label that I know to be true? Yes, sir. Like, do I have any angles here that I can label? Do I have any right angles anywhere? Which one? Where S is at, right? Is it angle R or is it angle S? It is angle S, okay? Because it says assume that they're tangent. So if this is tangent, then this is a right angle. So now I have a right triangle. And I know how to deal with right triangles, right? I may have to do some trig, I may have to do some special right triangles, or I may have to do Pythagorean theorem. Do I have enough information for trig here? No. Do I know that this is a special right triangle? No. So I'm guessing Pythagorean theorem is how I'm going to have to handle this. Um, but I know, I don't have anything to label RS. What could I label as RS with? R, R for radius. Or Y, Z. Okay. Anything besides what? 
X. So I can't label it X. Why? Radius is X. Isn't this the radius also? It's X. Okay? The radius is the same all the way around the circle. If you ever get stuck on a circle problem, you need to ask yourself, is there a radius somewhere I can label? Because more often than not, that's where you're stuck. Something obvious like a radius, you've known what a radius is for a long time. And there are times where there are certain things drawn on these pictures where even if it's perfectly to scale, the, the tricks it plays with your eyes, it, they won't even look congruent. Like you know it's the radius and you know they're congruent, but they totally don't look it, and they really are. It's just kind of the, the way things intersect, it makes it look weird. So it might not, it's probably not gonna be the first thing that jumps in your mind, even though you totally know what a radius is. So always ask yourself, can I label the radius? Don't make stuff up, because maybe the answer is no, but if you have something, you can label it as. So now I think I can actually do something with this, right? I know that this side is x, this side is 20. What would I use for this side? x plus 12, right? x plus 12. Uh, you're not done. All right, so I get x squared plus 20 squared equals x plus 12 squared. Okay, and I'm going to give you a minute to work on that while I go check roll. All right, so I get x squared plus what? 400. Does this equal x squared plus 144? No. Even if you don't know what it equals, you need to know it is absolutely not x squared plus 144. And I've said this multiple times this year. You can't keep making that mistake. You absolutely cannot. You need to know that that means x plus 12 times x plus 12. And then you FOIL, you do the box, you do distribution, whatever that makes the most sense to you. When you square a binomial, there actually is a shortcut that you learned in Algebra 1 that looks like this. If this is a plus b squared, then that gives me a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, okay? So I don't even I don't even have to do anything magical and like with FOIL. I mean, if you do FOIL, it's just like one more step and it's really not that big of a deal. But um, I know that I square this and get x squared, 12 times x, and that's two of those. So it's two times 12, which is 24x plus 144, okay? You don't, you don't have to use the shortcut. That's not for everybody right now. You probably, you definitely wanna know those when you're in algebra two, but at the very least be able to FOIL it or distribute or whatever you want to call it. All right, so now I'm here. What kind of equation does this look like it is? Quadratic. And if this is a quadratic equation, then the first thing I want to do is set it equal to zero. So when I go to do that, if I subtract x squared from both sides, what happens? It's not a quadratic. Those cancel out and you get 400 equals 24x plus 144. So now I'm going to subtract 144. So 400 minus 100 is what? 300. And then 300 minus 40 is 260. And then 260 minus 4 is 256. So you get 256 equals 24x, which means x equals 256 over 24. I write that down without hesitation. I don't know if it divides evenly, and I don't care, okay, because i got to get to that point anyway. Here, I could go off and do long division, but that is not what I suggest. You can sit here and ponder over what the biggest thing is to divide, but none of that matters either. Are they both even? Okay, other than that, do you, how many of you just automatically know a number without having to think? You probably don't, right? I mean, maybe that one all day, but you don't, and that's okay. I don't either. So what's half of 256? 128. And then 24 divided by 2 is 12. Well, look, they're still both even, so this could be... 64 over 6, I can do it again, and I get 32 over 3. Can I divide that out? No, it doesn't divide evenly. So had you, if you had gone off and done, done long division, you would have gotten a remainder, and then you wouldn't have known what to do with it, or you would have had to come back and do something like this anyway, or I don't know, made stuff up. I don't even know what the heck y'all do when y'all go do all that mess. But it's a waste of your time, because if, you, if, if this had divided out into a whole number, great. But it didn't, so I'm done, and that's great, and that's x. Am I finished, finished? No, I'm not, because it didn't ask me for x. It asked me for the length of RT. So now i got to take 32 thirds and add it to 12. So when I add, what do I need? Common denominator. So that 12 becomes 36. Oh, yeah, but then 36 over 3. So that means I'm going to get 68 over 3. Does 3 divide into 68? No, so that is the length of 
R T. We good? Any questions? Awesome. All right. Next page. All right, so this theorem says if two segments are tangent to a circle from the same external point, okay, meaning that, okay, again, these say that they're tangent, but we'd probably be allowed to assume that anyway. So those two segments are both tangent and they intersect from this same point right here. If that is true, then those segments are congruent. It's a very simple relationship, not that big of a deal, especially if it's just by itself like this. This tells me that line segment BA is congruent to AC. But sometimes you are given something that looks like that picture above it, okay, which is, again, it's not difficult at all. It's just that sometimes you assume things that are not true. Now, I tried to make that one kind of drastic where it was, like, long and skinny off of one side, but if it was more isosceles or looked more equilateral, then things wouldn't be so obvious, and you're more likely to make a mistake. But these three sides of this triangle are all tangent to the circle, so they all intersect the circle at one point. That circle is inscribed in the triangle, and that just means that it intersects at one point like that. So when you do this, if I'm looking for pieces or side lengths here, what you know, sometimes y'all tend to assume is that this point would be the midpoint of this segment, and that's not necessarily the case. Is that possible? Absolutely. But it doesn't happen every time. That's not what this theorem says. This picture basically uses this theorem three times. Okay, because these two segments are tangent from this point right here, so they're congruent. These two, uh, these two segments are tangent from this point, so they're congruent. And then these two little pieces here are congruent to each other. So there will be situations like that where it's a triangle or maybe it's a quadrilateral of some sort, and it, um, it, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there, um, a quadrilateral or a triangle or whatever, but then they may give you pieces of information and you have to find the rest and you may think you don't have enough information, but you do. And if you go and label what's congruent and think about how you can put those measurements in there, you'll have plenty of information. Okay, does that picture make sense? Good. All right, so then we're going to use the properties of these tangents. So it tells me these segments are tangent, so what does that tell you about them then? They're congruent. So that means that I get 3y is equal to 5y minus 28. Now, I know you'd like to move the smaller number, but if you have something by itself, I wouldn't suggest you move it. You can, as long as you do it right, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So instead, I'm going to move the 5 over here and get negative 2y equals negative 28. So what does y equal? 14. And then am I done? No, I have to substitute it back in. And this is all you hard-headed people need to listen. You're stubborn. You have to actually substitute it back in, even when it's easy. 3 times 14. Some of you lost some points like uh, for stuff like that on your final exam. You have no business losing points on that. So 3 times 14 is what? 42. And then that is the length of DF, which is what I'm looking for. Okay. Questions? Say that one more time. No, because you can't find the length of a line. So it's line segment DF. So line, line DF is the tangent line. Line segment DF is a tangent segment because it's a segment that's part of a tangent line. All right. So then this one, RS, line segment RS and line segment RT are tangent to the circle and from the same point, so they have to be congruent. So that means that X over 4 has to be equal to x minus 6.3. Now, can your answer be a decimal? Yes, because you started with a decimal, right? If you start with a decimal, you can end with a decimal. So it may not be a decimal. It could come out to a whole number, but, um, but it, a decimal would be okay here because you start with one. All right, I'm going to give you a minute to work on this while I hand out the homework. Okay, so there's two different ways you could start this. I could start by subtracting x from both sides. How many of you did that? Okay, then a few of you did, and that's fine. You totally can, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I wouldn't start with subtracting by um, x from both sides, and most people didn't, so I'm not going to work it that way, even though there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine if that's what you did. I would like to get rid of the fraction. Would you? Yes. Okay. 
So instead, I'm going to start by, and you don't have to erase what you did if you did, did it differently. I'm going to multiply both sides by 4. But when you do this, you have to be careful that obviously over here, those cancel out and you get x equals. Well, here, you can't just multiply 4 by one of them. 4 has to be multiplied by both of them. And you don't necessarily have to write this step right here, but you have to make sure you do it. Okay? You can't multiply 4 by just one of them. So this is going to give me x equals... 4x, okay, so we're going to, when you multiply by 4, you can double it and double it again. Sometimes that helps. Or let's think in terms of money. You got $6.30. So I'm going to take the $6 and I'm going to multiply it by 4. What does that give you? $24. Then the 30 cents times 4 gives you $1.20. So you got $24 and $1.20 gives you $25.20. Okay. So then I subtract 4x, so I get negative 3x equals negative 25.2. All right, so now you have 25 $1 bills. You have to make three even stacks, okay? If you get three even stacks, how many bills are in each stack? Eight. So you can make three stacks of eight, which means you have how many dollar bills left over? One. Three times eight is 24, so you have one dollar left over, right? And then that 20 cents. So now you have a dollar 20, you have to divide three ways. What does that give you? 40 cents, so it's 24. Does that make sense? You see how you can, th and the reason money helps is because when you have money, and if it's not some even amount, you have different bills and change that's already split up for you, and you can just think about how to split it up that way. All right, are we done? No, because no, it asks for RS, so I have to take 8.4 and divide it by 4. What does that give you? 2.1, and that is the length of RS. The more you make yourself do that number sense type of stuff, the better you get at it, and then it's no big deal. Okay? Any questions? We good? Awesome.